Good afternoon. I am Jordan Budd. I'm interim dean here at UNH School of Law, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the law school and to the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Policy. As many of you know, the mission of the Rudman Center here at the law school is to honor the legacy of Senator Warren Rudman, one of our state's greatest public servants, uh, by training the next generation of leaders in public service. And I, I do want to take a moment and note that we're particularly honored today to have with us Warren Rudman's uh, wife, Margaret Rudman. If Margaret, you could stand. <laughs> Margaret has been an incredible friend and supporter of the law school and the university as we've built this, uh, this center into uh, really the ambitious realization of, I think, the, the, the senator's expectations. And its mission is, as I mentioned, is really the training of the next generation of leaders in public service. And so given that objective, it's uh, particularly fitting that we welcome today one of, or another one of our nation's greatest public servants, General Stanley McChrystal. Um, we are so honored to have the general with us today to discuss with us his, uh, his inspiring and really ambitious proposal for the development of a system of universal national service among our youth. Uh, it, as we had a chance to speak briefly about over lunch, it, it is kind of a seamless connection, public service. It begins, you know, among young people earlier than high school. It carries through that period of time all the way through their work in college and, and in graduate schools such as this and through the rest of their lives. And um, his proposal is really, a, I think, a real uh, exciting uh, and profound challenge to the nation to step up our commitment to prepare young people for a lifetime in the service of our country. Uh, we're also honored today to be joined by president of uh, the president of the University of New Hampshire, Mark Huddleston, who is another of our state's leading public servants. So Mark, it's a pleasure. Well, thank you, Jordan. Let me just briefly add my welcome. As Jordan said, uh, we are going to be talking, thanks to General McChrystal's uh, presence here, about national service and citizenship. And I cannot think of a better venue for that, not only because of the mission of the Rudman Center, that is what it is all about, but that is really what the University of New Hampshire is about. We're about service to our state and to our region, and uh, I can't wait to, to hear the general speak. And to introduce the general, we have one of the products of our great service-oriented, um, citizenship-oriented uh, universities. And that is uh, a young woman who graduated just this last May, I think, uh, who is now working with City Year. She is absolutely identifiable with a lovely red jacket she's wearing. And she's working here in Manchester in an elementary school. And I'll ask Samantha Dokus to come up and introduce General McChrystal. Thank you very much, President Huddleston. Good afternoon. As President Huddleston just mentioned, my name is Samantha Dokus. I'm 22 years old, and I proudly serve with City Year New Hampshire. I attended the University of New Hampshire, where I majored in biomedical sciences and minored in dance. In July, I will be attending Penn State College of Medicine. My dream is to one day join the United States Air Force and become a military physician to continue serving my country. I chose to take a year off between undergraduate and medical school because I wanted to do something that I am very passionate about, national service. I heard about City Year and fell in love with the culture and goals that they embody. Similar to the Franklin Project, City Year dreams that one day national service will become a cultural norm and common expectation. I strongly believe that every young person should give a year of service, whether that's civilian or military in order to solve some of our nation's biggest challenges. My experiences with City Year have strengthened that belief and shown me the true importance of giving back to my country. Giving a year of service has allowed me to make a difference while also gaining skills that have helped me to become a better citizen. This year, I am serving at Bakersville Elementary School in Manchester, and I could not feel any more privileged. At City Year, we serve to provide students with equal opportunities to allow them to grow and succeed. 
Every day, I strive to show students that with hard work and perseverance, they can reach their goals. At the beginning of this school year, my teacher approached me and asked me to work with a student who was struggling with math anxiety. When I began working with this student, he would complain and our time together would almost always end in tears. This quickly motivated me to come up with some cool math games that would get him excited about learning. He soon became excited about learning math and his tears were soon replaced with smiles. Instead of complaining, he now commonly asks, Miss Samantha, do I get to work with you today? His confidence has improved and I could not be any more proud. My hope is that he will soon become confident in, his, in himself to realize he doesn't need my help any longer. It is now my great, great honor to welcome to the stage retired U.S. Army General Stan McChrystal. Okay, I don't think I have to say much after Samantha. <laughs> she literally embodies what we're talking about. So if you can keep that mental image of Samantha and what she's doing in your mind, multiply that times many, many thousands, and think what our nation will be like when we are a nation of Samanthas, then we're going to be in complete agreement. What I say today shouldn't be that comfortable for any of us to hear. Because if we already had it right, we wouldn't even have to say what we're saying here. But you're in a unique position. I'm in New Hampshire because there's an ability to leverage power that you have that other people in the nation don't have right now. Over the next 18 months, you're going to get a constant array of people coming through asking you for something. They're going to ask you for money. They're going to ask you for political support. They're going to ask for your vote. I don't want any of those. What I want you to do is to demand of those people that they address the issue of national service. I want you to demand of them that they give a direct answer to a very specific question that if they're elected, if they're put in power, will they make it possible for every young American to serve, because right now it isn't possible. There are just things that make it too hard. So that's my ask up front. Citizenship. This is why I believe so strongly in it. And you stop and you say, what is citizenship? Well, stop, what is a country? What are you a citizen of? And we're gonna talk country in this case, but we're citizens of communities and states and whatnot. But think about a country. A country is not something that God touched the, the ground and said, you are country X, the United States of America. A country is simply a bunch of people who came together and decided to be a country. They made an agreement that they would do certain things so that this could be a society. It meant that they would do things for the country and they got certain things in return for that. It's a covenant. A citizenship is nothing more than an, you have made an agreement. You have made a promise to other people of what you'll do. Yet sometimes when we think about citizenship, we think about something we're going to get. If we think about the Declaration of Independence signed in 1776, we think, okay, we're independent. We've declared certain rights. We've got inalienable rights. Great Britain didn't do for us what we expected. And so as a consequence, the 13 colonies say, we are going to be independent. It's sort of like a teenager, and I did at 16, 17, announced my independence to my father. He said, have at it, buddy. <laughs> Sent me off to West Point. <laughs> Not so much independence, but, but think about it. We think about this independence. We think about the idea of what we are as citizens, and if everybody for a moment thinks, what is being a citizen of the United States or a citizen of New Hampshire, a citizen of anywhere mean to me? What's it imply to me? You say, well, I get to vote. I am guaranteed certain rights legally. I am guaranteed the protection, security of that community that it gives me. I get a lot for being a citizen. But read the last line that they wrote. 
we mutually pledged to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Doesn't say anything about what's in it for me. It says, this is what we pledge to each other. This is what we are going to do so we can have something that we consider as sacred as this community in this country. And we've committed to ourselves to do that. Suddenly, the idea of rights really is rights and responsibilities. And that's really what I believe is so important now. Because I think all of us think that maybe citizenship in the United States doesn't mean everything it once made meant. Maybe citizenship in a community doesn't necessarily mean it. Benjamin Franklin, for whom this project is named, was famous for this. He started volunteer fire departments, volunteer police forces, all of these things because people gave the community because they had to. Now if we think of citizenship, we go back to rights and sometimes we say, well, I get to vote and I have to pay taxes. That's a pretty small definition of citizenship. I grew up in the Ranger Regiment. I entered the Army, and then at a fairly young age, I got the opportunity to join this amazing group of people, about 2,000 Rangers. And these are all people who decided, after they joined the Army, volunteered for the Army, they then volunteered to be a Ranger. And if you look at the haircuts we wore, you really had to want it. <laughs> we called them birth control haircuts, because you're never going to pick up a girl with a haircut like that. <laughs> I was lucky enough to stay in that much of my career, and this is my last day in the Ranger Regiment. And I had been lucky enough to get up to be the commander of the regiment. I'm standing in front of this regiment, and we did what we did every other day in the regiment. At the end of physical training, we said the Ranger Creed. Now, the Ranger Creed's a six stanza statement of the values of the Ranger Regiment. And every ranger memorizes it when you join, and every day after physical training, you all say it. And it's not a poem, and it's not a mindless mantra that you chant. It's a promise. It's a promise to every other ranger what you're going to do. And if you think about it, you're promising 2,000 other people, many of whom you've never met, that you're going to do some pretty big things, like the phrase, I'll never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy and they never once have violated it. And what that means is if you're comrades in the bullet swept street, you're not gonna do a calculation whether you're going, you're going, and you're gonna get him. And so every ranger's making a promise every day to 2,000 other rangers, and you go, wow, that's bigger than a marriage vow. But then you stand up and you look around, you got 2,000 other people making a promise to you every single day. And one of the phrases that I like most in this captures it. I'll shoulder more than my share of the task, whatever it may be. Not if I like to, not if I want to, not if it's easy, not if it fits my skill set, whatever it may be, because I have a responsibility that I've accepted because I joined this organization and it's so important to me to be a part of this organization that I'm willing to do those things that demands of me, because I think it makes me better. So why do we need to address this now? Why am I traveling around the country? Why am I pulling people that I admire to work on this? Because I do think we have a problem. I think as citizenship shrinks in people's minds, and that sense of the promise to others gets smaller, I think things in our society aren't exactly the way we want them. There are an awful lot of good things, but there are a lot of things that aren't like they could be and not like they should be. And maybe they're not going in the direction where the young people in our country get to view the future with as much hope as we got to. We have this sacred right of voting. Think how powerful that is. People fought for it for years. And in 2014, an impressive 33% of us went out to vote. And you say, well, you know, we're busy, we got a lot going on and, and whatnot. In Sweden, of course, they don't have as much going on, so a lot of them vote. <laughs> but my God, we're better than a place like Iraq. Uh-oh. Less than half the rate of Iraq. 
Now suddenly we stop back and say, America's exceptional. Exceptional ain't something you are, it's what you do. You're exceptional if you do that every day and, and how you behave and how you act as a society and individuals. That's not too exceptional. So what's the requirement? What do we gotta do? We gotta regain a sense of citizenship. We've got to, inside each of us, build something that says, I am a citizen, which means I have to do and be certain things. Many of us have it there. Many of us exhibit it every day. The kind of people who come to a talk like this probably embody it all the time. But not everyone, and not all of us all the time. And then you say, well, how did I get there? If you are a good citizen, how did you get there? How do you stand up straight? How do you believe certain things? Well, you were born a good parents, right? Maybe. Or you read a good book or you had a good civics class in school. But I don't think that's what does it. I don't think that's what did it for me. How do you deal with a problem like that? In 2004 in Iraq, we started to have this insidious problem that crept up. It was called improvised explosive devices, IEDs. And when they started, they were two or three artillery rounds that were taken out of Saddam Hussein's mini ammunition bunkers that weren't secured. And they were taken and they were wired together and buried somewhere. And then they were connected by a wire, but somebody would stand on the side of the road, wait for Americans, Iraqi military to come by, clack it off, and cause devastating damage. Later, they started using garage door openers. Then they went to cell phones. And it was horrific because as you patrol around the country, you're moving very carefully, you're in body armor, but you are constantly tense because it comes at any time. And as you're moving in the organization, suddenly there's an explosion. When explosion goes, because flash goes faster than sound, the first thing you do is you see a flash, like a flash bulb. Then you hear the thunder sound, and then slower than that, the shockwave hits. And if you're not in the direct blast, it hits you, and of course you go down immediately. You're swept by this noise. All of your senses shut down. You get sandpaper like blasted by sand and grit and small stones. And for a moment, you're almost in the fetal position as it just goes over you. And then your senses start to come back and things rain down from the sky and you realize they're pieces of wood and metal and glass and they start to rain because they went high up and it takes longer for them to get down. And they start to beat on top of you. First thing that comes back is your hearing. And you can suddenly hear and you can hear the crackle of the radio and somebody is starting to call for help. We need medical evacuation, we need more security. Then you'll hear other people starting to yell. Okay, we need to build security. And then you'll hear the cries of the people who were wounded but not killed often grievously wounded. And as this organization gets back up on its feet and it starts to deal with it, you form security, people immediately go to their comrades to see what injuries have been done, medical evacuations called in, sometimes by vehicle, more often by a helicopter, you hear the whoop whoop of the blades, pretty soon it comes in, and as you're watching, an individual is picked up, loaded on a helicopter. His, his or her comrades lose a little bit of themselves as they go onto the helicopter, as they watch their comrade leave. When this first happened, what we did was try to protect ourselves. We got better body armor, we bolted and welded metal sheets onto our vehicles. We tried to do technical fixes to stop ex improvised explosive devices. We used jammers that would project this jamming so that when you went in an area, a person's garage door opener cell phone couldn't project to the bomb. So you're presenting the, preventing the bomb from going off. We tried a technological fix to the problem. And of course, all we were doing was trying to stop the symptom of this terrible tactic. And of course, we did all the things afterward to try to provide medical care to our fallen. But you can do that forever because you're not fixing the problem. We realized you had to get left of the boom in time. The boom being the moment the improvised explosive device went off, you gotta get before it, not 10 seconds, not 20 seconds, you gotta get way before it and you gotta find out why are they doing this? 
who's doing it, why, and get at the root problem and solve the problem. We realized we had to get into the communities and convince people, don't do this. Convince them it's not in their interest to do it and get left of the issue. And we called it left of the boom. And I think it's true of almost every problem we face. If you don't get left of the boom, you just deal with the collateral effects of what happens. So how do we get left of the boom now? If our problem is a deterioration of citizenship, how do you do that? How do you get left of the boom? I don't think you start with 60-year-old people like me and say, you know, you need to be a better citizen. I think you go left and say, what makes a better citizen? And I would argue we got some of the best future citizens I've met sitting right here. And they're not going to be great citizens because someone told them to be a great citizen. They're not going to be a great citizen because they read something. They're going to be a great citizen because of experience. And sometimes that experience is not easy. I went to West Point. I didn't learn a lot of what they taught me, but I still fold my underwear. <laughs> I thought you'd want to know that. <laughs> because you do learn certain things through behavior, and then you start to realize this really does make a difference. This is the right thing to do. And you start to think of yourself differently. And so the way we want to get at citizenship now is we don't have a big defining event. We don't have the Depression. We don't have the Civilian Conservation Corps. We don't have big opportunities to pull people from towns and villages around America, put them together and give them this kind of experience. We don't have 16 million Americans in uniform like we did in the Second World War, which pulls people to a common cause, backed up by many other millions of Americans who are sacrificing and working in plants and whatnot. We don't have that kind of unifying event forced upon us. Instead, what we've got is this sort of slow degradation of who we are. We've got these petty political fights. We've got these other problems. And so what I'd argue is we've got to create the experience. We've got to create the unifying experience that changes people. And the concept behind this program, the Franken program, is to create a service year for all young Americans. Now there's programs for older people and younger people. This one's focused on citizenship, and the product is alumni. The product is people who go through a service year, who at the end of that service year come out differently. They come out as more experienced, more familiar with what the idea of responsibility is, and across a range of things. Because right now, we tend to think of service as service members in uniform. And for some reason, whenever we close our mind and we say, thank you for your service, we say, thank you for your military service. That's what we we're thinking. That's not what I think we should be saying. I think military and civilian service are two sides of the same coin, and they have to have the same kind of respect, the same kind of focus. And so we want, well, what we want to do is create a year of paid, full-time service for young Americans. Health care, education, disaster assistance, any number of things, because you certainly don't need everybody just in the military. You need them in this range of things. And then we need to create in that a culture, which we call service is voluntary, but expected. There are about four million young people in every year group in America. We think that when we get to one million opportunities, so a million young people serving every year, and we're way below that now, we're about 200,000. When we get to a million, then suddenly every lunch table in school will have somebody who's planning to serve. Every dinner table, every family will have somebody serving, and that's when you get to a tipping point, where suddenly service is expected. It's in people's psyche. It's not that one-off. What happened to Susan? Oh, she's doing service, and everybody kind of is quizzical. No, it'll be, the conversation will be not, are you gonna serve? Be where you're going to do your service. But it's going to take a lot. It's expensive. It's going to take effort across our society. It's going to take leadership from politicians, from business leaders, from academicians. It's going to take a lot of effort to create something that changes the culture of America. Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about pulling our culture back towards something we had before, but we're going to need different tools because times are different. We've got someone here in New Hampshire. Stefan, where are you? 
This is not a national program. Stefan knows where you live. He will hunt you down. And the idea is for us to create across America a network of people serving, informing others about service. Show me the mechanics which we can discuss in question and answer about this so that at the grassroots level, we have a demand for service and then we have an effective way to deliver it. This is what we want, right? This is what we all think we have. We think all of us in this room secretly say, well, these other people may not be responsible, but I am. What we really want from a society is a sense of responsibility. But I think we owe it to a generation to give them an opportunity to show it, an opportunity to build it, because it just doesn't come automatically. It's really not what our country's gonna ask of us, what are we gonna ask of us? What are we gonna demand of ourselves? What are we gonna demand of our system? Because our opposition to this is do nothing. Thanks for your time and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you have. Dempsey, who said not so long ago that one of our biggest threats to America was the uh, deficit, and this would obviously cost a lot of money. Do you have a solution for that? Yeah, I think General Dempsey, I think, did say that. I think the deficit's a problem, but what I would tell you is studies show that service like this actually pays back at about a three or four to one rate. We incarcerate more young men than any nation in the world. We have a host of other problems of unemployment and underemployment. 30% of our young people don't graduate from high school. So what I would argue is this is the kind of investment. It would not be cheap. I don't envision this would be, we don't envision this be a fully just federally funded. But I think that even if we spend the money to do this right, I think it's a very small amount of the expenditure considering the payoff we'd get. Because think about the value of having better citizens. What if the number I showed up, a number of people who voted was 66 instead of 33%? I don't think you could put a value on that. And so that's, that's why I would challenge that. Thank you, sir. Ma'am. You talk about creating a service here transfer. How far are you along in that? What does it look like? Would it be the same uniformly? A service year transcript. transcript. Yeah, when you are in the service, you get what's called a DD-214. And it's a record of your military service. And when you go to uh, get a civilian job or go to education, often you take your DD-214 and you have a record of what you've done. So I think two things. We have to create a service year transcript so someone has proof of what they've done that is understandable across our society. Because right now, in many cases, if someone comes in and says, I did something and the people aren't familiar with what that program is, it's really hard. So I think we've got to make it clear, you know, an accepted document but also communicate with clarity what it is we're talking about. What did that, what experience is that person bringing? So you can still walk away. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. But we, we absolutely think we have to have that. What else? Sir. Mr. Sprott, under President Truman, have you studied what happened with his successes and his failures in the national service? We've studied many of them, which are you gonna bring up any particular part of it, sir? Inertia of the system. Yeah. Inertia is the biggest problem we got. I think our, our biggest challenge in America is it's too dark, it's too high, it's too scary, it's too hard. And so creating a system like the, uh, a program like this is going to be difficult. But you know, we're starting with proven programs. We're starting with AmeriCorps, City Year, Teach for America, Peace Corps. They're all part of this uh, constellation of current activities. AmeriCorps in the Serve America Act was authorized for 250,000 positions. It is funded to only 80,000, only 40 of which are full time. So there's, in 2012, 580,000 young people applied for those 80,000 positions. So the demand far outstrips current supply and existing organizations exist to execute much more supply. So what we need to do is fund part of what we've got grow those, and then there will be new programs that have to be 
creative. We're not talking about a single big department of uh, national service in the government. But, but don't uh, misunderstand me. This is not an easy thing to do. But I think it's so fundamental, it has to be done. Ma'am. It's a law. The Serve America Act was passed, and it was passed with bipartisan support and then increased, but it hasn't been funded except to about 80,000 slots as opposed to the original intent and commitment to 250,000. So we're less than one-third of the funding for that that was already envisioned and put into the law. Yes, ma'am. Is there additional effort to There are efforts, but there's not a single effort. There's every year there are efforts to push back in funding, which runs up against obvious uh, other requirements and priorities. But yeah, I think it's one of those first things we need to do. Sir. General, you come from a life of service, and so perhaps you take this for granted, but in, in promoting your program, how do you explain to others the satisfactions that come from helping other people? Yeah, I think most people start a service experience without service as the primary reason. I entered the military at 17 because it was going to be an adventure, and it was an adventure. The reality is that sense of satisfaction comes when you do things that matter, not just for customers that you're working for, students in a class or people like that, but with the people that you work with. It's an intangible, and I think that intangible becomes personal satisfaction payback, but it also becomes this sense of you're a different person. I think the young people here, please. Um, I think that as far as you know, personal satisfaction goes, uh, you mentioned that we didn't, we often don't go into service for satisfaction. I went into service because I come from a really working class background. I got my master's degree and I had no opportunities to go into employment. My parents don't know people. My dad's a shop foreman, my mom's a waitress, and service gave me this great opportunity to get, you know, get job skills, get career advice, meet new people, experience new things that I wouldn't have been able to do without service. And after I started my service, I'm in my second year now, I got all of this satisfaction that I wasn't expecting from, you know, my first year working in the Manchester Homeless Services Center to my second year, I'm a VISTA leader now, over 24 other people. And it wasn't something I was looking for in the beginning, but it means so much more now. Yeah. Sir. How do you see civilian <coughs> service developing leadership skills? I think it, it will vary based upon the experience, but typically people will work in groups, whether it's City Year, AmeriCorps, they work in groups that have the opportunity. Not every position will have the same kind of leadership skills, and people who do it between high school and university or a job may not get the same opportunities or the same level that someone coming after university because it's 18 to 28. But I think at every time you interact as part of a team, you develop it. Now I think as these programs go, if you look at established programs like Teach for America uh, or others, they have very focused efforts to build service experience or leadership experiences and teaching. But all of those are going to vary a little bit, so it won't be one cookie cutter. Sir. General, thank you for uh, supporting the service year idea. I strongly uh, approve of that, and uh, in fact, I'd like to see the draft reinstituted. Uh, you mentioned uh, voter, low voter, voter turnout here, and also elsewhere, uh, uh, near record lack of trust in government as symptoms of the problem you're trying to fix. Uh, I and many other people uh, think that the flood of money and politics uh, is really the root cause of those two problems and many others. And uh, uh, there are nonpartisan uh, or bipartisan efforts to try and fix that problem. Is that something, uh, do you agree? And if so, is that something that you could uh, speak out on or sign on to either personally or through the Franklin Club? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, the question was really money and politics and what I feel comfortable opining, my personal opinion and what I do it through the Franklin Project. Yeah. 
And the answer is, I do agree. I think the amount of money in politics is out of control. But that's not appropriate for me to say as part of the Franklin Project, because the Franklin Project is focused on the national service part. Separately, I would say that I do think it's an issue. And I think it's an issue that we as a nation have got to address very directly. And I'm happy to, to speak out on that. The Franklin Project is designed to be very nonpartisan. It's designed not to be owned by either end of the political spectrum. And so what we try to do is, is not let it get too enmeshed in, in other parts of it. Ma'am. On a lighter note, how do you feel about Brad Pitt uh, portraying you in the movie adaptation of The Operators? And was there another actor you would have preferred? <laughs> I expected Schwarzenegger, but uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, those th if you start taking that stuff seriously, you're lost. What else? Sir. is about branding and the, the point the gentleman's making that there's a lack of specificity in the branding of what we're doing, what the product is, and then what we're asking people, service members to potentially do. And I think that's true. One of the problems with branding will start, and we understand there's a big problem, and I, I touched on it earlier. If I said there's a service member in the back row, you're going to look for a Marine or a soldier or an airman because that term means something to you. If if to most Americans you said, there's the VISTA person back there, most Americans don't know what that is. And if they have heard the term, they don't know what that does. And so as a consequence, when someone says, I just got out of two years in the service, and you go, you know, what, what unit were you in? Well, I was in AmeriCorps. People go, excuse me? So we have a branding problem there, quite honestly. But you know, when you go in the military, you say, I'm going to be a soldier. You can do everything from be a, you know, a pharmacologist to be a veterinarian. I mean, there's this wide span of things, and yet they are understood to be military or army, military service member and whatnot. I think that one of the things we're going to be able to do with this is shed more light on it. One of the problems is people don't know about the opportunities. I never even heard of AmeriCorps till I was out of the service. I didn't know any of the specific parts of it. So Cisco has been very helpful in donating help to create a digital exchange, which is a digital backbone, which is going to provide all of the positions that are available from different organizations. And then people will be able to go in and get detailed information, see what the qualifications requirements are, and start to marry potential demand with potential supply and then also link together funding for that, some of which will be provided by government funding, some of which are going to have to be corporate or individual philanthropy to do that. Because I agree with you, we have this amorphous set of things that uh, don't have the clear definition to help sell it. Sir. Thank you for doing this and for being on the exchange this morning, which will be repeated tonight for people who missed it. Oh, thank you. NPR. But I wondered if you and the Franklin Project have uh, in mind other models from other countries, such as the one that occurs to me is Cuba, which virtually eliminated illiteracy before we even established the Peace Corps by such a program. Do you have other models like that? We've looked at some others. I, I think if we went to the Hill and said we're going to model Cuba, we'd get a certain, you know, <laughs> resistance. But, but, you know, there are a lot of countries that do some version of this. None of the ones we've looked at fit comfortably. 
completely. But if you go to Israel, where everyone serves in the military, they will argue about everything except service. And that's just sort of a given. Yeah, we do that. And that's where we're trying to get in America. We're trying to get to the point where we will argue about other stuff, but once you, you go down to where did you serve, that becomes a common denominator between the two young Americans or two older Americans as they talk back later. Ma'am. It does seem we kind of missed an opportunity to insert this at the point where the draft was eliminated. And um, I, I heard the exchange this morning too, and you said there just wouldn't be an appetite for reinsta reinstating the draft even with a service component. But is the the vision would be that it gets accepted enough that then you can go back and make it compulsory? Or I mean, what's the strategy? Do you have parallel lines where you're trying to work on getting a compulsory service also? Yeah, right now our stated and, and real goal is to get voluntary but expected. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I personally am a big mandatory person, but that's not the position of the Franklin Project. So I don't want to say I'm doing a bait and switch because we're not. We're, we're trying to change the cultural expectation here. But you know, yeah, we have missed some opportunities. If you go back to that period, I would argue right after 9-11. Had we gotten serious about this after 9-11, I think there would have been a lot of resonance for it. But you know, the next best time to do it is now. There's not a next best time after that. And so I just think we gotta take it on. Sir. Have you gotten universities across the country to get on board with undergraduate graduates, undergraduate students to to promote service right after they graduate? And that is an open time right in there. Yes, sir, we're working a lot of different programs with universities right now. Met with I've met with university presidents by the by the dozens to try to do this, and I think there are going to be a range of different programs. One, for example, Tufts has been in uh, place for a year and a half now, almost two years, and their program is called One Plus Four. And you apply to Tufts University, and your first year, you are kind of like red-shirted. You do national service, then you start the next year and do your four years. They get a more mature freshman. Their national service is conducted under the supervision of Tufts, although it doesn't have to be in Boston. And if you're on financial aid, they pay for it. And so the parent who's worried about their kid getting on to college, and the kid goes, well, I'd really like to go to a gap year. Sometimes there's an angst that says, maybe my child or, will go off and, and never go to college and you're worried. This is one that says, okay, yeah, they're going to college. They're part of this. So we're looking at one plus four, we're looking at two, one, two, and then other colleges are already supporting immediately after graduation. One of the things we've got to take on there is resistance though, cultural resistance for get on in the workplace. You know, particularly, I teach at Yale, and a lot of kids there are gonna get on to greatness. They're gonna get to Wall Street, they're gonna get on to something like that. And they're afraid that if they don't get on, they're gonna get a step behind. And so what we are working with a program called Employers of National Service is for employers to publicly state, we value national service. And we want some of them to go even further that says, do your national service and then report to us one year from now. And I think that can lower some of the angst because right now I think there's cultural concerns about that. But th this is all part of getting it into uh, the, uh, the system, I'd say. Yes, sir. Sir. When you integrate religious service among ma many major churches have service uh, periods, and do, have you contemplated that? I know the church separation issue, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, there will be faith-based service that will qualify to be certified, so the answer is yes. Ma'am. If you just look at what I was going to ask, you mentioned qualified to be certified. Um, these different organizations, I'm thinking, why do they actually need you? In a way, you sound like this layer of bureaucracy, and particularly some of these universities have programs that seem to be working very well. What is it they need from you, and are they working with you, or are you just more bureaucracy? I don't think we're more bureaucracy, but it's a fair question. The question is, why would an organization need us or want to be a part of this? Now, there are organizations that seem to be working really well. You take Teach for America or the Peace Corps, but they're very small. The, the, the scalability of all of either of those programs has been severely constrained by funding and, and other support. Uh, I would say that organizations do need us because as we push through the idea that a certified service year experience has value for the person coming out of it, two things happen. One, 
they're going to get more people wanting to serve in that. And second, they can compete for funding. They can, they can say, we are a certified experience for X number of young people here, and they can come in for funding. Plus, an awful lot of people like universities understand if we can create a common metric, you know, an accepted metric of what a year of service is, that has a value in itself because otherwise, if you have very, very different views of it, you know, some of them are just not going to be viewed as credible. Yeah, that, uh, question, that is what your organization will be doing is setting sort of a standard for that year of service that you <coughs> certify organizations? There is a coalition of organizations. The Franklin Project is organizing a coalition of other organizations to do this. We are not, we have a mighty staff of six full-time people. And so we're not creating a big bureaucracy. We, we're not the conduit for money to these organizations. We are being the advocacy to organize this constellation of things into a coherent single plan that will get more resonance with the American people, get more resonance with things like Congress, the Serve America Act, so we can make the service year a reality. The execution will be done through all of these agencies, much more local because we think that's going to be much more focused on the problem and much more efficient in the end. But I just don't think a big bureaucracy is what we need right now. Ma'am. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the internships that college students who are being informed of corporate welfare. Is this going to be like a form of non-profit corporate welfare in, in place of like decent entry-level jobs? Yeah, that's a great question. The question is, sometimes internships for uh, commercial corporations are viewed as like free labor for a year. Is this going to be that? And that is not the intention. The intention is those certified positions in those nonprofits have to be viable, real, valuable positions. And then that nonprofit can get funding. Maybe it's funded by Serve America Act. Maybe it's funded by philanthropy to provide the person or people who do those jobs. So in one sense, the, the nonprofit may not have to pay for it. They may have to pay part of it. It may be paid for by outside philanthropy. So to a degree, we're helping them get labor, but it's got to be certified positions of value that give that person the kind of experience that we're talking about that has the value. Because remember, the real goal of this is alumni. The work is of value, but the goal is alumni. It's better citizens later. Ma'am. Thank you, General. Um, I appreciate you know what you've had to say, and I had the opportunity to be an AmeriCorps member 12 years ago, and it was great, paid off a lot, some of my loans. Um, but I also had the privilege of being married and having a place to live while some of my fellow AmeriCorps members were making about federal poverty and had yeah. minimal of any health care. So for those of us in the room who you know really want to be on board with what you say, what are you asking us to do to forward the mission, but also make sure that the experience, you know, not just the alumni experience, but while you're doing it, is if not sustainable, you know. You're an alumni, what do you, alumni, what do you recommend? Uh, well, I, I, as I said, I had I had a place to live, but I watched people who went from Florida having no, you know, winter gear, trying to live in Hartford, Connecticut, on nine thousand dollars a year. And I'm not saying people should do this to make a lot of money, but I, I think that there are financial implications to living at the federal poverty level, you know, for a year. And I, I'm not saying can we, you know, double the salaries, but what what would you recommend? How, how do we get there? I think those of us in this room are for service, but what what would you ask of us who aren't 18 to 28 anymore? What would you, what would the, I think I know what the fix is. What would you say the fix well, is? Money's always a good solution, but it's got to come from somewhere. Do you so vote? Do you have to, I do, yeah. Then <laughs> people listen to you. That's really what I'm saying here. You know, we have got to pay people enough money so that a parent feels comfortable having their son and daughter in the environment which they're going to serve. Now, as you say, it should not be enough money to get in trouble. It should not be enough money to confuse it with a lifelong job. No, it's not. But it should be, you know, reasonable so that it's safe and it's, you know, you can eat well and you can do all the things that, that you do normally. But this is, this is what we need here. You've already served. I'm not asking you to serve again. I'm asking you to demand, if you believe in the program, if you believe that you're a better person than you were before you served, and you think other people ought to get that opportunity, you got to demand of people. You got to demand of politicians and you got to demand of your fellow citizens. You can't just say, boy, wouldn't it be nice? Because we can close our eyes and wish forever, and it probably won't happen unless we do something. Sir. I'm a firm believer in you reap what you sow. How low, how deep does the initial 
kernel get planted for someone to, to, to strive towards national service. And the high schools have some requirements that, uh, that their service, uh, that some service to the community be provided as a prerequisite to, to graduation. Is there any in integration between the, the programs you're talking about and those school programs to, to lead someone into that desire to go ahead and, and serve when they get older? Yeah, I think there should be. There almost has to be. You have to start the discussion of it. I knew when I was about three I wanted to be a soldier because I was around my father and whatnot. But the reality is if we don't put these kinds of things in front of people and talk about them, if guidance counselors don't talk about them, if we don't get in junior highs, if people who are alumni don't come back and say this is what I did, if they don't see people in classrooms, then it's hard to suddenly at 17 or 18 years old to say, hey, everybody, here's something brand new. We've got to socialize it with people. We're trying to work with media to get it into movies so that heroes and TV shows and movies will either be doing or have done service. Because right now you never see it. Everybody's an ex-SEAL. Nobody's, how many ex-VISTA volunteers or VISTA service members have you ever seen in a TV show? So I mean, it's those kinds of things. And then there've got to be a series of advantages for someone. This is not altruism. Gabriel said it was beautifully in a session we had earlier. Say it again, Gabriel, because you say it better than I do. Stand up and say it. Uh, I just said that uh, you can only appeal to people of altruism so much. Uh, I'm serving uh, with the Student Conservation Association, AmeriCorps, and I have a great quality of life, and I'm gaining really important skills from my teacher, and I'm getting a lot out of the experience. Um, I'm happy to be serving and educating on the environment and getting young people outside, but that is really only a small part that I'm serving. I have no doubt that this will provide me with skills and experiences to build my future on. We think there has to be a business case for this that goes to the individual level. And it means that if I decide to serve, I have to believe that when I finish serving, there's going to be an education stipend, which there is, but there's also going to be me in a better position. I'm going to be, it's going to be easier for me to get accepted to a university. It's going to be easier for me to get a job. It's going to be looked at positively. It gets to the, the DD-214 equivalent. You've got to have convinced people who do this that they are advantaged from the experience, not just altruism. It's not just a year of sacrifice. Sir. Captain General, uh, earlier you had, I think you had talked about one possible component would be uh, of a military component. Or, or is there, how do you reconcile, how can you do that of your service that might somehow interface with a military role? Is there any way to do that? No, I may have. What I meant was the military is one way to serve. So if someone gets to age 17, 18, and they want to serve, then the military is an option, government service is an option, any of these is an option. I really believe, and I've talked to other people, we had have single recruiting stations. Right now we have separate recruiting stations for Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Peace Corps, Teach for America. Really, there ought to be one place you go physically that all these options, and if you don't qualify for one, all the rest of them are there, and it really could be largely online. One spot, and you start to put in what your situation is, and suddenly it tells you what your options are. And a lot of things you wouldn't think about. You know, you go in there and somebody says, well, I've always wanted to be X, and then I found out I can't do that. All those other options are there, and I don't think we have anything like that now, and it would not only be much more effective, I think it'd be much cheaper be more efficient at the end of the day. Sir. General, you talked about incenting young people to a year of service, but I'm curious how you would address the question of incenting parents to encourage students or young people to pursue that path. The question is how you'd incent parents. I think what I would say is first you've got to reassure them that the child is going to continue to what they, they hope, whether it's university or a certain kind of job, that sort of thing, so it's not a a uh, detour, a negative detour. Second, I think what you do is you convince them that their son or daughter is going to come out better. Now, we don't have a generation, we actually have two generations without much service. We stopped the draft early 1970s and we got about two generations that weren't asked to serve. There were people who did, Peace Corps and whatnot, but it, pretty small numbers. So we don't have a lot of parents with that experience. So we are going to have to educate, really, my generation and the one right below me what this means because there's a hesitation to tell somebody to do something you didn't do. But it wasn't their fault. We didn't ask. And we didn't make it 
you know, possible in many cases. Sir. You've spoken about the, the challenge of funding from <clears throat> not necessarily the participants, but those who are sponsoring these programs. And I wonder if you are working to define programs where the funders actually make out. You know, it's all, so much of it is, how do I make out? If I fund, what are my gains? And not just out of a broad band, but how do you, how do you sell it? Yeah. Um, I don't have a great answer to your question. I guess I'd go back to employers of national service. If an employer funds a certain number of people doing a year of national service, I think they're going to get a better employee. So I think it'd be pretty easy to make a business case for a company that they invest this year, 20 some thousand dollars to give a person a year, they're going to come back a better person. But there's going to have to be proof in the pudding over that. More broadly, it's going to have to be belief in the system, I think. Jay, any? Tax incentives. You could put tax incentives, yes, sir. I think politicians would respond to something that is going to make me get reelected or something of that nature. And that, you know, that, that's a hell of a challenge. And you don't want to do it politically, but you want to make it so obvious they can't avoid it. Yeah. Well, this is the place to get people to do it. This might be the last question. We're up, yes, we're up against our 2 o'clock right. deadline. Oh, sorry. Uh, General, I, I am an alumni of Teach for America, and I stay in touch with a lot of my friends through Facebook and all across the country. We still visit and see each other a lot. And I know a lot of um, my colleagues when I was a core member, um, we were definitely involved in public service, and we still are engaged in public service. Uh, and it, I hear there's concerns about, are, are my kids going to be OK? Is this really going to pay off? What kinds of studies are you doing to go back and track that? Like, I know TFA sent me Yeah, we got to know about the, the question is how do we communicate to parents the experiences that people have had that also show the value that they got out of it? Is that fair? I think you're exactly right. That's a challenge we have, and we don't have that licked yet. We're, we have got to get the word out, the kinds of experiences we have here, the kinds of experience that you have, the difference you make in what you do for the rest of your life. Because statistically, the studies I've seen in Teach for America, you join Teach for America to burnish your resume and then to go on to something, but in reality, a huge percentage stay in things that are essentially service. And so. I'm going to be a public defender here in New Hampshire next year, and that's, it, yeah. that spurred me to want to do that. So. Exactly. And it's that kind of thing that's too anecdotal now, but I think it's very powerful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.